prophets missed the most significant development of the twentieth century. In 1830, Hegel was appointed rector of Berlin University, and a year later he was decorated by King Frederick William III. But the antics of the world's spirit were now beginning to worry Hegel. In 1830, another revolt occurred in Paris, and this time Hegel wasn't out in the marketplace planting a tree of liberty. When a ripple of this revolt spread to Berlin and prompted a popular uprising, Hegel became ill at the thought of mob rule. A year later, he wrote an article in the Prussische Staatszeitung, Prussian State Times, criticizing the reform bill that was then passing through the British Parliament and airing his views on British democracy. In Hegel's view, the British Constitution was simply a shambles. He observed, compared with the rational institutions of the Prussian state, and popular government, even the severely limited form practiced in Britain at the time, was a distinct impediment to the waltz time dance of the world spirit. The blue dialectic. A government should not even try to express the will of the people. The people never knows what it wills. But even this was far too revolutionary for the Prussian authorities, and the second instalment of Hegel's article was censored. In 1831, Berlin suffered from the cholera epidemic that was raging through Germany, and Hegel moved out of town for the summer to a house in the nearby countryside. But nothing. Not even cholera could keep him from his beloved lecture hall. In November, he returned to the city and delivered his first two days' lectures with a fire and energy of expression which surprised his hearers. His biographer Rosencrantz put this uncharacteristic eloquence down to the initial effects of cholera. On the third day, Hegel succumbed to the disease, and the day after, on November fourteenth, eighteen thirty-one. He died peacefully in his sleep, unaware even that his life was in danger. He was buried as he had wished beside Fichte. His tomb, which can be seen in the Dorotheenstadt Cemetery just north of the city centre, is now regarded as a national shrine. As soon as Hegel's sister Christiane heard of his death, she began writing a memoir describing their childhood together. This she sent to Hegel's widow, and some time afterward drowned herself by walking into a river. Five years later, Karl Marx arrived as a student in Berlin and was introduced to the work of Hegel. After absorbing the main thesis of Hegel's ideas and then reacting against them, he synthesized his philosophy of dialectical materialism, not at all what Hegel had had in mind for the world spirit. Afterward, Hegel wished to be taken very seriously. And his wish came true. All over Europe, the philosophical antidote of Hegelianism spread, rendering entire university philosophy departments immune from philosophical thinking. Hegelianism, with its enshrinement of the status quo, was just what was needed in Wilhelmine Germany and Victorian Britain. Such a glorious obfuscatory pion to the bourgeois state would surely have had to be invented, if Hegel hadn't taken the immense trouble of creating it. Hegel's philosophy fulfilled all the requirements of the age: discipline and order, a belief in hard work for its own sake, the improving nature of suffering, faith in a rigid system whose metaphysical foundations remained beyond all comprehension. All these were required of Hegel's readers, to say nothing of the late nineteenth-century middle classes. Hegel's profound, all-embracing system resembled a colossal glass bead game, an intellectual challenge attracting many of the greatest minds of the time. And so it might conceivably have remained, but Europe was not about to enter the long stability of another medieval era, where the dialectic would take on an even greater role in thought than the syllogism. Or was it? Attempts were certainly made, in differing forms yet with similarly horrific results, to institute such an era. Yet the blame for these monstrosities cannot be laid at the study door of the lonely professor in his yellow-gray dressing gown. His crime against language was obfuscation; theirs was lies. His understanding of the world was ultimately a stupendous intellectual fairy tale. They chose not even to try to understand the world, but to change it. Hegelianism has been seen as an immensely elaborated Platonism. Plato believed in the ultimate reality of abstract ideas rather than the messy world of particulars which we appear to inhabit. The world we see around us is only real in so far as it partakes of these transcendent ideas. For example, a red ball partakes of the abstract ideas of redness, roundness, elasticity, and so forth. 
but in Hegelianism this simple melody of Platonic ideas was transformed into an interminable Wagnerian opera cycle of bombast. Ironically, all this may not have been a complete waste of time. Such grandiose metaphysical systems may have unwittingly served a historical purpose. The intricate techniques of the alchemists were similarly infused with metaphysics and intellectual whimsy, but they are now seen to have kept alive and developed the ideas that were to become chemistry. A similar process may well have been at work in nineteenth-century philosophy, with its vast metaphysical systems keeping alive and developing humanity's most ambitious intellectual project, a total systematic explanation of the world. The intellectual alchemy necessary for such a project continued to develop while modern science was in its infancy and incapable of such ambitions. But eventually plausibility prevailed, and now, instead of the dialectical method metamorphosing base arguments into gold, we have come to place our faith in the rickety and explosive apparatus of science. Hegelianism's hubris was its claim to scientific rigour. As we have seen, the dialectical method was neither logical nor scientific, but even worse was Hegelianism's belief in an absolute based on the structure of science. The notion that this absolute was the only ultimate reality led to a dangerous downgrading of the real world and those who inhabit it. The individual became something that didn't really exist, but was only part of a process that transcended him. The plagues of the twentieth century were political, and belief in this suicidal notion was to be their bacillus. From Hegel's Writings All the rational is real, and all the real is rational. The Philosophy of Right. Preface It is possible to show that the notion of philosophy is implicit even in our everyday thinking. We begin with our immediate perceptions and desires, but these soon urge us beyond their immediacy towards the apprehension of something greater than ourselves, an infinite being and infinite will. This is the course I have pursued in the Phenomenology of Mind. The Encyclopedia of the Philosophical Sciences in Outline 3 Time, like space, is a pure form of sensuous perception or intuition. It is the condition of all immediate, active perception, as well as that which is perceived, i.e. of all experience, and all which is experienced. Nature is made of space and time, and is a process. When we stress its spatial aspect, we are aware of its objective nature. When we stress its temporal aspect, we become aware of its subjective nature. As we perceive it, nature is an unending and continuous process of becoming. Things arrive and depart within time. Such things are not only within time, but they are also temporal. Time is a way of existing. The Encyclopedia of the Philosophical Sciences in Outline, 201. Every true or real logical thought has three aspects. Firstly, the abstract or comprehensible aspect, which indicates what a thing is. Secondly, its dialectical negation, which says what it is not. Thirdly, the speculative, which is concrete comprehension. A is at the same time that which it is not. These three aspects do not constitute the three aspects of logic, rather they are moments of everything which has logical reality and truth. They are part of every philosophical concept. Every concept is rational, is an abstraction opposed by another, and is comprehended by a unity with its opposite. This is the definition of the dialectic. The Encyclopedia of the Philosophical Sciences in Outline 13 all science, apart from philosophy, deals with objects which are taken for granted. The items under investigation are merely accepted prior to their scientific investigation. Likewise, interpretations gathered in this way are verified by referring back to the given material. Sciences have no need to justify the status of their material. Mathematics, jurisprudence, medicine, zoology, botany, and so forth naturally presuppose the existence of magnitude, space, number, right, sickness, animals, plants, etc. With philosophy it is different. Philosophy begins in doubt and argument. It opens with a question about itself. The object and method of philosophy are not assumed or agreed before we start philosophizing. Investigating these things is what philosophy is about. This is what is so problematic about the subject. 
On the one hand, philosophy must begin by investigating itself, and on the other it must mediate with the world. This necessary uniting of the immediate and the mediate is what philosophy is. The Encyclopedia of the Philosophical Sciences in Outline 1, 2, 3 Experience and history teach us this. A government should not even try to express the will of the people. The people never knows what it wills. But even this was far too revolutionary for the Prussian authorities, and the second installment of Hegel's article was censored. In 1831, Burr prophets missed the most significant development of the twentieth century. In 1830, Hegel was appointed rector of Berlin University, and a year later he was decorated by King Frederick William III. But the antics of the world's spirit were now beginning to worry, compared with the rational institutions of the Prussian state. And popular government, even the severely limited form practiced in Britain at the time, was a distinct impediment to the waltz-time dance of the world spirit, the blue dialectic. Hegel. In 1830, another revolt occurred in Paris, and this time Hegel wasn't out in the marketplace planting a tree of liberty. When a ripple of this revolt spread to Berlin and prompted a popular uprising, Hegel became ill at the thought of mob rule. A year later he wrote an article in the Prussische Staatszeitung, Prussian State Times, criticizing the reform bill that was then passing through the British Parliament and airing his views on British democracy. In Hegel's view, the British Constitution was simply a shambles, he observed, 